Welcome everyone to BHP Live, BHP's online interactive Q&A session for shareholders. I'm James Agar and I'm joined again today by BHP's Chief Financial Officer, Peter Bevan. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. It's been about six months since we held our first BHP Live event. Uh, we got some positive feedback from shareholders. You told us you'd like to see more of this, so here we are again. Peter, it's been a busy time for BHP. What's been happening for you over the last six months? Yeah, it's always a busy time here, but the uh, last six months have been good, actually. Um, I think operationally we've done really well. I mean, the last six months, all the operations came home more or less across the, the world in, in really great shape and uh, produced some, some really, really nice results. Yeah, we had good, good prices as well. So if you put all those things together, I think it was a good result for the six months and for the year. Uh, we also worked hard on our portfolio. Uh, you know, Shale has been a, a difficult issue for, for the organization, but I think that having got in not well, I think we have now announced the sale of Shale, and I think that has is, that is been a, a really good transaction. Uh, we're still to complete, but that's done in terms of the agreements. And we also managed to tidy up a couple of smaller mines, one in Chile, one in, in, in Queensland. But importantly, we continue to invest in the, in the business as well. And in fact, we announced uh, the approval for the, to go into execution of South Flank in Western Australia. So great. Excellent. And you, you touched on results. We released our results last week. How would you uh, summarize those for shareholders? Well, as I say, I think the organization went well. So the things that we controlled went well. We, for the year, we increased production by 8%. Uh, and uh, we also managed our costs very well. So if you put those two things together with really good prices, uh, it meant we made some really nice profits. Uh, I think on an EBITDA basis, we made $24 billion which is $2 billion a, mu a month, which is, you know, that's, uh, that's not too bad. Um, we continued to invest in the business, and so we invested almost $7 billion, $6.8 billion in capital. So if you put, again, those two things together, you end up with a free cash flow, which is essentially the cash flow that is uh, available for distribution or to the balance sheet for shareholders, and that was over $12 billion. So again, on a monthly basis, a billion dollars of cash, which is available for shareholders per, so, you know, per month. So what did we do with that 12 billion? Well, we continued to uh, strengthen the balance sheet. And so we, we reduced net debt by $5 billion. Today, well, at the end of the, the last financial year, we were at $10.9 billion, which is really quite, uh, which is at the bottom of the range that we want to be in. We want to be between 10 and $15 billion. And I think you should expect the company to continue to have a conservative, strong balance sheet. So we'll stay at the bottom end of that range in the, in the, near, in the medium term. What we also then had was plenty of money left over for shareholders, and so we declared dividends for the year through the interim as well as this final of $6.3 billion, uh, so good cash returns to shareholder. And, that's an and then in addition to that, we'll get the, the proceeds of shale back to, to shareholders, either in the form of dividends or in terms of buybacks. So plenty of cash going back to shareholders, as well as obviously continue to grow the business for the long term. Great. Well, look, uh, on that note, Peter, I'm going to start with the questions now. And the first one's uh, very much a, a related theme. It comes from Meredith in Sydney. Um, I can tell from the way she writes the question, she's pretty happy with the dividend. Um, but she wants to know if she can expect more of the same in the future. Yeah, we had good, as I say, great dividend. In fact, the final dividend, I should have said this a moment ago, the final dividend was 63 US cents, and that's a record. So that's, that's really great. Um, look. What will happen in the future will be dependent on, on lots of things, you know, prices and so on not being in our control, FX. But I think the underlying business you sh is going well and we expect it to continue, obviously, to go, in fact, better in the future because we will have more productivity. Productivity is such an amazing thing for us over the last four years, say. We've, we've produced about 12, 12 and a half billion dollars of, say, of additional value from productivity. That's more, getting more out of our existing business. And we've got more of that to come. Plus, as I say, we continue to invest in the business. So that should underpin uh, with the world going, you know, so long as the world doesn't fall to pieces, which we don't think it will, put those things together, we should be able to continue to generate good, strong cash flow. Balance sheet is where it needs to be. We will continue to invest and there will be uh, uh, good dividends for shareholders, we think, in the future. 
The way we think about capital, the cash we produce, we have a, something called a capital allocation framework. First of all, we look after the business, then we look after the balance sheet, then we pay 50% of all earnings in cash to shareholders, and thereafter, whatever's excess goes to compete between further investment and further returns. And as you can see, for this last year, we balanced those two things nicely. Great. And look, uh, the 63 cents US per share uh, for the Australian shareholders tuning in, is that a fully frank dividend? Uh, yes, fully franked. Um, and I think you know, we've, we continue to generate really good profits here, pay really large amounts of tax. Very happy with that, That's as it should be. And so we, will be able, we should be able to continue to fully frank that uh, for the foreseeable future. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll change gears now. We've had a number of questions, uh, Peter, on the, the shale transaction. Um, if I could summarise the main areas of interest, uh, well, when will it be completed uh, and how will you return the funds back to shareholders? So we should be able to complete uh, by the 31st of October. That's the, the plan uh, and that's going well. Uh, and so what we then need to do is get the cash in the bank at that point and get it back hopefully by the end of this calendar year, either in the form of uh, more cash dividends or in the form of buybacks, either in the PLC line or in the limited line. We haven't decided yet, uh, but when we, before the 31st of October, we'll announce how to get it back. Very good. Well, let's stick with oil. Uh, this is a question here, uh, Rob from the Gold Coast. Rob say, asks, you've sold your shale assets, but why are you staying in conventional oil? Well, we've been in conventional since the 60s, and uh, conventional has been a great business for us, and mostly it's been our highest returning asset, almost invariably it's our highest margin asset. It's a big part of our portfolio uh, today. And so what we think about is that we like oil, we like gas as commodities. We think they are, we know they're big, we know they're growing, and we know that you can make money, you can make good returns for shareholders for your future investments. So we also know that so we like the commodities, we know that we've got great assets today, and we know that we are more than likely not going to have great assets in the future because we have life, long lives, relatively long lives for our oil and gas assets. Plus exploration has been very successful over the last uh, recent past, so we've got the prospects of, of additional projects coming. Uh, and then finally, we've got great capability. We are absolutely one of the best deep water operators in the world. There's no question about that. So if you put that together, we've got a great commodity. We've got great assets and great capability. We, sh we do make good money for investors today, and we'll continue to be able to do that in the future. That's why it fits. Very good. You, you touched on expiration. Any successes recently? Where, where are you looking? Yeah, so we've been looking uh, in a quite a, a sort of a very focused there, set of regions, regions that we know the geology, we know the politics, we think the fiscal terms are fair, and so we have uh, been really drilling at this point in time in the Greater Caribbean. Uh, we've also, uh, so that's really in Gulf of Mexico on, and in Trinidad and Tobago in the south. We've put down, I think it's five holes in the last year or so, four of which have come up with hydrocarbons. And so, you know, that's great. That hit rate is really outstanding and we've got more to come. So, of course, what we then have to do is turn those into projects and money, but that's still to come. All right, we're going to go back to the dividend now, Peter. This is a question from Joe from Adelaide. He wants to know if he's eligible for the dividend and also wants to understand how the dividend reinvestment plan works. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Joe, you'll be, you'll be eligible as long as you own your shares on uh, as of the 6th of September. I think it's the, uh, that's the date. Uh, I think if you're in South Africa, it's the 5th of September, so just one day different. Uh, but if you own them, then you'll get the dividend. Um, uh, the DRP, the Dividend Reinvestment Plan, now that's something which our shareholders have been asking for for a few years. It's, it's uh, quite common here in Australia. And essentially, it's quite simple in its concept. If you want to uh, take your cash dividend and uh, turn that into shares, and you rather uh, then computer share can do that for you. So they'll take your cash dividend, they'll go into the market, they'll buy shares in BHP, and instead of getting your cash dividend, you will receive the equivalent value in BHP shares. It's effectively it's a it's a quick. Uh, a cheap way for you to uh, reinvest your dividend in BHP. Very good. I'd, or, and oh, sorry, the other thing is, is it's entirely at your at your election, so this is not compulsory in any way. 
of course. Okay, well look, uh, I'm going to take a question now coming in from Lucy in Western Australia. Um, Lucy wants, to, wants you to talk about your investment plans for the future and she specifically asks, is there anything big on the horizon? Always big things in BHP, that's the kind of the size of Yes, we've got plenty of uh, investment going today. As I say, we've got, uh, we've just invested 6.8. This year, this financial year, next financial year, great set of projects, we'll put $8 billion in both years. Uh, we have five major projects underway at the moment. Those are projects which are bigger than 250 million our share. So those are uh, in iron ore, in copper, and in oil, and also in potash. And so we continue to, to look for a way to get into that, uh, what could be a very attractive investment for, for BHP for, for another 50 years. Uh, we've also got alongside that some of what we call latent capacity projects. These are smaller projects, but what they do is you put a small amount of ca capital in and they open up the, invest the, uh, the, the, uh, the production capacity of an existing uh, asset. And, uh, and so you get a really fast payback, really high returns. Those have worked spectacularly for us over the last four, say three, four years. We've got four of those underway and we've got, an, and like the major projects, over and above the ones that are underway right now, we have more in the future for the near, the medium and the long term across the commodities. So yes, there is more to come. Very good. Um, I'm gonna, collapse a number of these questions into one, Peter. We've, we've had a lot of questions come through on costs. Uh, what, what are we doing to cut mm. costs? Take us through the actions we're taking on that front. Also, a specific question on that point coming through, Peter from the Docklands. He wants to understand if we're seeing a significant rise in inflationary pressures in Western Australia specifically. And do you, or do you think talk of inflation in that jurisdiction has been exaggerated? Uh, well, what are we seeing? I was in Perth yesterday and I was doing the usual thing. You always check in with your teams and then you ask the taxi driver as you go back to the airport and happily, you know, those are consistent in the, in the, in the feedback. Look, we are seeing an uptick in activity in Western Australia. Great for the folks out there. There is, uh, we have a, my, uh, a big project underway uh, in iron ore, there's a couple of others that are underway. There's some activity probably coming in LNG. Uh, one of those is Scarborough, our own project with Woodside, so we're happy with that. So you're starting to see some, some inflationary pressures in certain pockets. But more or less this is, you know, I'd say is more of the same at this point in time. Uh, the same thing would we see across Australia as well, as in Queensland as well. So yes, we are having to work a little harder. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, but on the other hand, the good news is that, you know, we've still got uh, a few things in our pocket, more than a few things in our pocket, to try and offset that inflationary pressure. So, so you and the taxi driver are aligned? Yeah, we're pretty much aligned. <laughs> Very good. Well, and, and we don't have to worry about Uber, which is what he was also <laughs> worried about. Very good. Well, look, um, we're going to take a wander outside the mine gate now, Peter. Uh, this is a question from Jack in Adelaide. He wants to know, has the slowdown in demand from China impacted the company? Uh, look, a slowdown is, uh, is, you know, we're talking about a slowdown of growth. So as China gets bigger, inevitably the rate of the expansion of that economy, the growth in GDP, has to, uh, has to, to, to slow down. But because the base is so much bigger every year, notwithstanding you have a percentage growth, which is, which is smaller, so you still have a huge amount of demand coming. And so that's exactly what we have, have seen, we are seeing today. Uh, they, have, uh, they have some issues. Obviously, the world is a little concerned, as we are, about uh, trade and some of the tariff, uh, tariff war, if you like, uh, that, that, is, uh, that appear, appears to be in, in place at the moment. But we haven't seen direct impact on our business, but, but and it, we're also seeing that the Chinese are taking steps to just to mitigate some of the potential uh, negative aspects of that through monetary policy and, and investment. So we're, and then they've got this thing called Belt and, and Road where they're investing in the region. So all of those things say, put together say that we continue to be pretty uh, calm and continue to be quite bullish about the impact of China. Look, there's one other thing which is really important about China. It's not just that there is underlying demand. Those folks have, have really taken up the, uh, uh, the cudgels uh, on environmental 
uh, reforms with real intent. And so what they've been doing is they've been passing a series of laws to try and ensure that they clean up their, their skies in particular. What it means for us and for Australia is that there's been a much sharper uh, increase in demand for high quality products that we can provide. And that is in iron ore, in met coal, and in thermal coal, even in copper. And so what is happening is we have two things happening at the same time. One is increase in demand from, from China, but also an increase in demand for the types of products we produce. So we're having a double positive whammy effect from that. And so the prices of our products have been going up as a result. And that's really what, one of the big features. We think those reforms, they're absolutely here to stay. Great for us. Very good. Well, let's stay on the outlook. Peter, and you've, talked, you've spoken about China, you've spoken about environmental reforms. Uh, Paul from Queensland, just take a, a, a broader view here. He, Paul wants to know where is the demand coming from in the future? So perhaps just talk through some of the big trends you've spoken about China, but, sure. but what else is happening out there? So, so when we think about the strategy for the organisation, I think for any company really, you really got to think about, try and get in the, for a in the way of, in, the, in a positive way, of the big trends, big secular trends that are happening in the world. And so those are relatively straightforward. We know what those are. There's going to be more people in this world. Those people are going to want to live better, higher standards of livings. And the other one, big trend is that, of course, the world is going to change the way it produces energy. There's going to be a decarbonization. So if you think about our strategy, that's we try and put ourselves in line with those secular trends. So if you think about more people, two ways of that we are going to play that. One is that there's going to be more energy consumed, no doubt about that. So therefore, our energy products, the hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and the small amount of high quality, but, but the small amount of thermal coal, those will continue to be able to uh, produce growth for us as well as, in fact, very strong margins. The second thing that those additional people are going to do is they're going to eat. And there is going to be the same amount of arable land, maybe even less because of climate change. And so, in fact, the land that, that produces the food to feed this increasing global population needs to be more productive. That means it needs more fertilizer, and therefore that's why we're interested in potash. So the other part of that, as I say, more people, but they want to live better. So there is going to be increased investment, ongoing investment in more infrastructure, more roads, more bridges, there will be more cut. People want to drive cars, they want to have washing machines. And so steel will continue to be in strong demand. And again, we've got that well covered with our med coal and our iron ore. The, thir the third big secular trend, I think, is decarbonization. Look, the best way to play that is copper. If you're going to move, copper is there to move energy. And it does it in a very efficient way. And so as the world uh, goes to, say, electric vehicles, say two things will happen there. One is that they're going to, that you need four times as much copper in an electric vehicle as you do in a conventional car. So we're extremely well placed in that. The other thing that's going to happen is going to be more batteries. And we, and that's, those batteries are increasingly, the technology is changing in that. And we're going to be more, mostly it's going to be nickel in those. And, uh, and so while nickel business, nickel west, I think we're also are going to be able to play that. So I think, it, importantly, I think, and you would hope that BHP is not only well set for the near term, but for the medium and the long term. Very good. Well, let's uh, bring it back closer to home. Uh, Derek from Western Australia. Another question from Western Australia. Great to see uh, our shareholders um, from such an important state for BHP coming through. Uh, Derek says that South 32 has done very well since the spin-off and he wants to know if we spun off the wrong operations. Uh, look, very happy that South 32 is doing very well because that was exactly what we, we hoped for and intended. If you think back to why, why we did the separation, uh, it's, it, it was really because we need those, those assets in South 32 are, are different in their, in, their, in their style to the ones that we have. We have very large uh, long life uh, operations and the South 32 uh, operations are just a, a different, some of them are more downstream 
and they just need a lot more uh, management time and attention. They tend to be smaller as well than ours. So I think it was entirely appropriate that we just separated this, those, those, those two sets of assets. What we were also anxious not to do when we separated South 32 was to crystallize what was at that point. We did want to change the portfolio, sharpen the focus for both sets of management, but what we didn't want to do was crystallize the values that were available in the market at that time. So we decided not to sell it for cash. And so we let, obviously, shareholders own the shares in South 32. And as Derek says, that's been a really good thing, particularly for those folks who held on to it. So as far as I'm concerned, I think South 32 has really worked out well for BHP. We've managed to sharpen our focus on the big things as well as on the South 32. So very happy with that. Excellent. OK, well, uh, going to take a question now from Salvatore from Smithfield West. Uh, Quite a topical question here, Peter. I know this applies mainly to BHP's Australian operations, Salvatore says, but what impact is the policy uncertainty about Australia's electricity future having on BHP's operations? Yeah, look, uh, well, we've had some impacts in the past. We had a, we had a, uh, not, a not a very pleasant outage in South Australia back in 2016. Uh, we've we solved that. We have got security supply into our operations, I think, across the board. But we have seen a, I think it's a 60% increase in, in our energy bill in Australia over the last three years. So there is no question that as we continue to want to obviously run our existing operations, in fact, even expand our operations in Australia, we, like the rest of the country, needs you know, a, an energy policy that will allow for three things. We need to have affordable electricity, we need to have a reliable e electricity, and we need to have that energy in a form that is kinder to the environment. And so in order for that to happen, you need to have, I think, a legislative underpin. So the investments that are necessary to, to achieve those three uh, uh, objectives at the same time are in place. So obviously, you know, there's been a huge amount of debate about this, the National Energy Guarantee policy. I, we thought we supported that and it more or less met those three objectives. Uh, and obviously we look forward to, like the rest of Australia, I think, we look forward to the government uh, and the politicians in, in general coming up with the solution that we need to have in Australia. Okay, well, you mentioned Olympic Dam and we have got a question here from Don in Adelaide. Um, he says, I've read something that Olympic Dam is broken again. Can you provide an update on what's, what's going on up there? Yeah, look, I, Olympic Dam has a, has a problem with its uh, asset plant at the moment. We're just, uh, we're just fixing that at the moment. So, you know, Olympic Dam has been one of those. It's a, it, an asset that is, is very complicated. It's got a lot of stuff happening on the surface because of the, uh, the, the nature of the ore body. It's, uh, and, uh, and it's also quite an old asset. In fact, it's been going for 25 years or so. So I think we have got some work to do on Olympic Dam. No doubt about that. We put a lot of money into it. Uh, in financial year 18, it was a big shut. Uh, we are continuing to have to invest, I think, uh, uh, more money this year, next year, just to restore the, the stability of the, that operation. I think that is, that is absolutely a known I set of issues. We will, are getting through that. So in, in the future, we will have a much better asset from, from a financial perspective, from three, th three aspects. One will have more stability. There's no question that's, 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 that's still not quite there today, but it's on its way. The second thing we need to do is get more tons out of it. We get 180,000 or so tons out of that thing. And we, it's a big fixed cost operation. So we need to put more tons out of it. Two ways to do that. The first way is to get better grade. We are now developing into the southern part of the, that huge resource body. And so we can move the grade from more or less 2% to 3%. So that by itself will have a big impact. That's called the SMA, the Southern Mining uh, Area Project. The second thing we need to do to get more tons out is we need to increase the throughput of the existing assets. We do 10 million tons a year there. We should be able to get 12 million tons out. That is, there's quite a bit of investment needs to go into that. That project is called BFX. That's still to be approved. But in the event that we did those three things, more stable, um, better grade, more throughput, no doubt in the next five years, Olympic Dam is going to make a, a lot of money for, for, for investors.
but just and maybe more importantly is make good returns for, for investors because it's not doing that today. Right. Excellent. Okay. Well, look, we're coming up. We've, got, we've probably got about five more minutes, so we've got a couple more questions here that we'll get through. Uh, I'm sure technology will be part of that story uh, at Olympic Dam that you just referred to. Anders from Melbourne wants to talk to you about that. He wants to understand where we're at with the deployment of automation at our mine sites and how do you measure the return on investment um, in relation to technology investments. So where we are in automation, uh, it's really in, in the bulks at this point in time. So it's in Western Australia in particular. We've got autonomous trucks running. Uh, I think the whole, all of Jimblebar is running uh, on autonomous trucks. We have autonomous drills. And what we're, we're seeking to do is really accelerate that deployment now, having established the, 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 the technology and uh, the operational stability of that and also the business case for that now, what we need to do is now uh, put that to, to work across Western Australia, Queensland, take it to Chile and so on. And as you say, different applications and underground uh, scenarios. But what I think is very important is that that is just one piece of the value chain of how we, of a mine. From a mine, we have to plan, we have to drill, we have to assay, we then have to, you know, uh, blast and haul and so on. And all across that value chain, you can see that technology today can uh, give us applications that will improve every part of that value chain. And you put all of that together, you can see a very big impact on uh, the, product the productive nature of uh, the existing businesses. And I, I think it's, I don't think we know all of the answers of what this can quite throw up for us, including the challenges also. Mm. But I, what we do know is that it's going to be very, very big for us. And so big impact on safety as well. Big impact on safety. I mean, it's amazing that, that the, the statistics of Jimble Bar, you say, okay, you make the, the trucks autonomous. And we say, well, okay, so we take drivers out of the line of fire. But in fact, what we've seen in there is the, the recordable injury frequency rate has gone down across the entire uh, uh, operation. I'm not sure I can completely understand exactly why that is the case, but it is the case. And so there's a strong correlation. I think the other thing which is very important is, look, technology is here. It's a, one of those big secular trends in the world. Very important that we are at the forefront of that. I think it's a great opportunity for our employees. I think it's a great opportunity for Australia. Australia needs companies like BHP to be at the forefront of this because we have no choice. Yeah. We have a very positive uh, reason to do this, but if we don't, we're going to get left behind, and BHP is not going to get left behind. Okay, uh, well, let's um, turn now to Russell in Beaconsfield. Russell's got some questions on Samarco. He, he wants to understand where the remediation project is at, what's the cost been thus far, and what do you expect in terms of future costs? Yeah, so the remediation, uh, I think from an environmental perspective, is well underway. The water quality in the river is back to or better than what it was before the, the, the disaster. Uh, so, and, the, and the vegetation grows very, very quickly there. And so, so that's been, I think, uh, that's been good. The fish population is recovering. It's, it's, it's I think, great on that perspective. Look, the, on the community side, we, we have compensated 260,000 people for, for uh, issues with their water quality. We've, uh, we have three villages that we have to rebuild. Uh, we've had agreement with those folks for a little while. We were held up a little bit with licenses, but those licenses have arrived from the authorities, and so the rebuild is, is now underway. And that's a most important thing. And we continue to look to, uh, to get the, uh, the, the, the rest of the compensation program finished up. We have a, a provision of $1.3 billion uh, mm -hmm. on our balance sheet. At this point in time, that's what we think it's gonna cost from here. So it has been an expensive exercise and there is another $1.3 billion to go in terms of costs. But we are you know, making good progress on, the, on what we have to do there. Excellent. Okay. Well, look, we're almost out of time. We'll take one last question, uh, Peter. This one's a good one to, for you to close on. It's a question from Mick in uh, Petersham. Mick would like you to give us an update on what, what BHP thinks the outlook for its shareholders is. Well, I think that the outlook is very good. I mean, because the world is growing and we know what those big trends are. And I think BHP is absolutely 
able to more than uh, survive. In fact, we will, we will flourish with all of those big trends going forward. And we have got the right commodities, we've got the right assets, and we've got the right capabilities. That's the winning formula for resources. Get those three things right with a strong balance sheet and a capital allocation form formula. We call it the capital, uh, capital allocation framework. If you put those basic building blocks together, you win. And so I think this has been a winning combination. This last year was very good for shareholders, and we expect more of that for the near term, for the medium term, and for the long term. Very good. Well, thanks all for joining us for our second BHP Live event. Uh, if I realise there are a lot of questions submitted. Thank you for those. If we didn't get a chance to, to get to them today, we will have our investor relations team respond to you directly. Uh, but thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to doing it again soon.